and begin. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I'm Alison Bush, and I teach Hindi and Hindi literature in the Middle East, South Asia, and African Studies Department. So it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Anastasia Hilyavsky. We're very lucky to have her on the East Coast. Uh, visiting at Penn for just a few weeks, and she's made time to come over and spend the day with us giving not one, but two lectures at Columbia, one in the anthro department. Um, so, Anastasia is um, a researcher and theorist of social anthropology and political life, and she has a long association in various capacities with it turns out, U.S. academia, but more recently, uh, Cambridge. Okay. She is uh, the recipient of numerous prestigious awards. I cannot list them all here, but most recently, a Newton Lieberhulme Early Career Fellowship at the Cambridge Center for Research in the Arts, Social Sciences, and Humanities, a center uh, with the acronym, for better or for worse, CRASH. Uh -huh. She's been awarded uh, a Wenner Grant Friend um, Fellowship and has been a Rhodes Scholar and has uh, been involved in numerous exciting projects uh, that are uh, both received and are uh, hopefully uh, in the process of receiving some <laughs> European uh, European Research Council funding. Uh, one is called Democracy and the Criminalization of Politics in South Asia. We can look forward to a number of forthcoming publications. Uh, we were talking about uh, what it takes to bring a book to press. Uh, soon, forthcoming from Stanford University Press, we will be looking forward to India's hierarchical democracy and its implications. She also has uh, an edited volume that has been uh, received with considerable acclaim. This is Patronage as Politics in South Asia. I'm really myself looking forward especially to the Modern Asian Studies uh, special volume on the morals of Gunda Raj. So I'm just putting that out there. Uh, that great title. Right now one particular interest is uh, politics in the vernaculars and a couple of us will be soon gathering in at Penn on Friday to um, participate in a project being co-organized with Lisa Mitchell there to think about the vernacular lexicon of uh, political life through various periods in South Asia. Yet another book project that we're about to hear something about today uh, concerns hierarchy in South Asian politics and I would like to uh, Announce the title then of the talk today is Hierarchy as a Value in Indian Democracy. So I'm very excited about it. <laughs> Look forward to it. Okay. Thank you so much, Alison. That's a very nice and generous introduction, and thank you very much for inviting me. And everyone says, Thanks for abandoning the great weather outdoors when you come and see it actually is true today, isn't it? So you have, you have been very kind. Um, so actually, this is, um, as and I were just talking about our first meeting, which was now already five years ago, um, and it is a marker of age that that stretch of time seems a lot shorter, subjectively. Um, but um, this, this essay, it's, it's an informal essay, it's not sort of a research paper. Um, um, it's, it's an outcome of thinking that I've been doing um, since the time that I first met Alison and Shelley in, in Jaipur, where I was doing my research at the time, of the year, um, studying in, in local democratic life. And it really, that this thinking began then, very much so, so it's, it's quite um, sort of nicely placed in the narrative to come here and talk about the outcome of that. So, um, in the 71 years since India's independence, much ink has been spilled over Indian democracy, about, uh, over its founding fathers, its legal and institutional architecture, its capacity to mobilize, its failures to include, its privatization and criminalization, its resilience, intensity, diversity, and size. So there's been a lot of hoo-ha about Indian democracy. 
yet, no discussion, and much less debate, has focused on India's democratic values. The ideas that motivate and orient its citizens' engagement in their democratic lives. Of course, celebrations of India's democratization are often accompanied by comments on the spread of what are referred to as the democratic values. But the question of exactly what these values may be remain un unremarked. It is as if these values are self-evident, um, as if they require no further reflection. So at the heart of this constellation of values, which are presumed to be the democratic values, is the ideal of equality. The idea which is treated in Euro-American academics as well as popular political mythos, I would say, as democracy's very essence, as the value that distinguishes it from other forms of government and really makes democracy what it is. It's an essentially egalitarian form of political life. Um, but in the democratic politics that I have observed across northern India for quite a long time, um, in rural and urban Rajasthan since really 2002, also in rural Madhya Pradesh and Uttar Pradesh, um, and also in the slums of Delhi. Uh, I haven't done field work in defense quality, uh, but I should really do that. Um, but m most of my field work has been in Rajasthan, both urban and rural. Um, so in the democratic politics that I've observed across northern India, equality neither framed the value that my interlocutors ascribed to democracy, why they thought it was valuable, nor did they animate their involvement in the democratic process. Quite on the contrary, what oriented engagement in electoral politics and democratic life of the people who I met there was the value that they placed in hierarchy, a value that also substantially shaped their otherwise social lives. So this essay is a brief report, really, on what I learned from my interlocutors in Northern India about how hierarchy shapes their democratic lives and why, more generally, they see good in hierarchy, and also about what we may try to learn from them, not only about how democracy works in India, um, but also about democracy as such. But first, let me make a brief set of comments on why any attempt to understand how people act within and think about democracy in India or really anywhere else demands that we pay special attention to values. Quite apart from the fact that we can't make sense of politics or otherwise social life without understanding the values that shape people's political judgments and orient their pursuits, the need to reflect on democratic values I think is particularly urgent and pressing because we think that we already know what these values are. If in discussions of other features of political modernity, like the state, bureaucracy, or nationhood, the idea of a nation, social scientists have had a, a lot to say about their ideological content of these phenomena, um, about the kinds of values that the Europe American history of these um, institutions and ideas have charged them with, how these values have changed over time, and indeed ways in which they have been transformed in different cultural contexts. Um, but when it comes to democracy, it is really as if we're dealing with something morally stable, absolute, a kind of political order that is perceived universally in the same terms through, through the same set of principles. Principles concerning the constitution of a political community, um, the constitution of political relations, um, and of political legitimacy. So, of course, for Western or Westernized academics um, and lay folk alike, democracy is first and foremost a political order that is egalitarian both by origin and in essence. A government of political equals where every morally and mentally competent citizen gets an equal say in the way that their country is run. Each has an equal right to vote and stand for political office, to speak, associate, and assemble for political purposes. Each is not only political equal to her fellow citizens, but also to the people she elects to rule in her state and on her behalf. So our presidents and prime ministers aren't our masters, but fellow citizens, whom we entrust with the execution of our political will. Or at least that is how things are meant to be. When we speak about democratic equality, we do not, of course, think that we're describing matters of observable fact. 
Only the most ingenuous would believe that citizens of democratic states have an actually equal say in how their countries are run, or that they have truly equal access to political office, or to having their political views heard or acted upon. What we mean instead is equality as a normative principle. Equality as a value that makes democracy a political good. A value basic to the democratic sense of political justice and legitimacy, which moors the democratic vision of how political community action and responsibility ought properly and fairly to be organized. So this naturalization of equality as the democratic value in current Euro-American folklore has made us quite blind, I think, to the variety of democratic <coughs> imaginations across time and space in different cultural contexts. In Europe, America's past as well as its in its present as much as in India or other places in the world. Now how and why equality has been enthroned in the metropolitan discourse as the infallible all-purpose political value and the necessary condition of democracy is really a job for the historians. But if you strip this egalitarian imagination back, what there is is actually a much more minimal, normatively open-ended idea one that can absorb whatever values a given society may live by, which may be non-liberal, they may be illiberal, or, as we've seen in some accounts of democratic life say, in South Africa, some good ethnographies of that, um, are quite um, explicitly anti-liberal. After all, the word democratia, the ancient Greek word, uh, from which we derive the English um, current equivalent, refers to nothing more than people's rule or to power being shared in one or another way among the people who have polity. Or, as um, Josiah Ober, a political a historian of political ideas, has pointed out, simply enough, the term demos refers to a collective body. Nothing more than that. Any kind of a collective body, not necessarily a society of equals. If kingdoms and caliphates concentrate power in the hands of their rulers, democracies then ought to distribute it among those who are ruled. In itself, this tells us nothing whatever about how this is to be achieved, through what kind of moral, social, or political principles, through what kinds of relationships assumed to be good, or through what kinds of institutional means. It doesn't tell us who these, the people are, or how they should be organized, nor how they should relate to their rulers, nor about the shape of their government. So all of that really is um, rather open-ended. It tells us nothing whatever about equality of political participation or equality of political community or sovereign equal citizens, only about the involvement of the people who are being governed in the process. So the global success of democracy, and I think it has been a remarkably viral political institution, I think that's quite um, indisputable, I think rests precisely on this um, capaciousness on this normative open-endedness of the idea. For otherwise, how could democracy possibly migrate, settle and naturalize as successfully as it has done around the world if to be good Democrats, to believe in democracy as a political good and enact it in as much good faith in any, as anyone can do, people would have to espouse egalitarian value. In the historical and ethnographic archive of, of humanity, egalitarianism is in fact exceedingly rare. It's confined chiefly to small-scale societies on any, on any expansiveness of, um, of egalitarian ideas. In, in the ethnographic ar archive, we know that it's confined chiefly to small-scale societies of hunter-gatherers in places like Siberia, Papua New Guinea, or the Amazon. Were egalitarianism the necessary condition of democracy, most of the world would have to undergo, if you are to trust the ethnographers, a very drastic cultural revolution on a, on a seismic scale. It would need to embrace radically new ideas about how social and political relations ought really to be organized. Ideas that are profoundly foreign and often repugnant to many people around the world. It is impossible to assess accurately the extent or speed with which cultural change can happen, with which people can adopt um, principles and values um, that are new, but we can be sure that nothing so drastic, no global conversion to egalitarianism has really come to pass. And yet, this seems to pose no problems for the social scientist, most of whom assume, although rarely discuss openly, that no foundational change in cultural imaginations is required to accommodate democracy and its presumptive egalitarian mandate. 
The idea is that once democracy arrives in a country, once elections are instituted and universal suffrage is secured, its people, whoever they are, wherever they may be, will sooner or later embrace equality as a political ideal. For scratch the cultural service, or throw off the yoke of oppressive feudal regimes or false consciousness, and you will find a species of born egalitarians covering the surface of the globe. And that really is the running assumption in current social science. Observers who have taken culture more seriously have been less sanguine about democracy's global victories, for they think that many other cultures are at base incompatible with it. So Churchill, who did take culture extremely seriously, thought that democracy was a moral misfit in India, where people were just too hierarchically minded to cope with the egalitarian demands of democratic life. Needless to say, Churchill was less than prescient, and he was wrong on two counts. The first is rather obvious. India, uh, democracy spread like wildfire in India. And the second is less so. I think he was also wrong about hierarchy getting in democracy's way. Here, as I shall su suggest in this talk, hierarchy has not only proven no obstacle to democratization, but has in fact been a major, major vehicle of its success. Now, of course, by democratic success, I don't mean any statistically calculable positive social or economic outcomes, but the sheer capacity to engage um, a vast and very, very diverse electorate in its political process. But first, again, another caveat. Let me briefly explain what I mean by hierarchy, and very crucially, what I don't mean by it. Um, and what hierarchy can possibly refer to has been a matter that has caused considerable confusion in the social sciences, and it's very difficult to tell what people mean by the word when they use it. And for that reason, it may not necessarily be a good term to use, but um, I haven't found a better one. So more precisely, um, as a distinctive concept, hierarchy, so as a concept that can show us something about the world that other words don't, um, it refers to inequality as a social good. More precisely, it describes what we could call a moral logic of unequal relations, or ideas about the way that people who are in one or another significant respect, not one another's equals, could relate in a socially fruitful, positive, and a personally positive way. Now, what exactly these ideas are and what sort of a good they can achieve varies a great deal around the world. But the crucial thing to understand about the concept, and this is something that the, the major, the main theorist of hierarchy, Louis Dumont, tried hard to convey over the course of his career, is that hierarchy is not a descriptive term um, that describes some sort of a stratified um, shape of a uh, imagined shape of, uh, shape of society, which is opposed to equality, but a prescriptive one which is opposed to egalitarianism. So it's a, it's a fundamentally normative idea. Now, in its original use in medieval theology, which um, was first used in the 6th century um, by Pseudo-Dionysus, um, it first referred to celestial forces, then it um, referred to the organization of the Catholic Church, and later to the whole of creation, known back then as the Great Chain of Being, and it described um, a kind of cosmic totality which was harmonized by degrees of proximity to God. Um, right, so cosmology usually depicted as a pyramid, which it's, it's an image that has lasted in European thought from late um, antiquity until today. If you Google um, hierarchy in the Google image search engine, you will see a lot of pyramids. So that's, that's sort of the, it's the basic image we have. So this particular hierarchical vision of a whole harmonized through the principle of a proximity to a single supreme force, a vision that comes out of Christian theology and the church, has really dominated Western social theory and has passed into the study of India through the work of Dumont, who described Indian society as a pyramid ranked by degrees of proximity to ritual purity as the paramount value. Right. Um, the beneficiary of the scheme, as Dumont thought, was society as a whole, not the individual person who relinquished her own happiness for the sake of harmonious perpetuation of the social whole. And it's an attitude that Dumont called holism. 
Um, so that's, that's the sort of standard vision which has on the one hand been rejected by contemporary um, social scientists but when um, they try to describe the cultural version of um, the cultural idea of hierarchy to undergraduate students or to lay people that is what they sort of trot out as, as the standard caste hierarchy idea. Meanwhile, most other contemporary social scientists have been confusing hierarchy with inequality, treating all social differences of worth, power and privilege as moral iniquities that spell injustice, unfairness and social abuse, which deprive people of agency, of power, of dignity. So even if they recognize that hierarchical arrangements can usefully organize complex social activity, structure governments, organize um, relations in families or, or firms, they still treat them as a necessary evil. Necessary, but still evil. Any attempt at comprehending non-egalitarian hierarchical ways of thinking appears as a vice, as a collusion with oppressors and the advocacy of oppression. Now, this confusion arises, as Dumont thought, from our own normative commitment to equality as the source of all social and political good, a commitment that addles any attempt to understand other ways of conceiving social good. So this egalitarian commitment, which is now sacrosanct in the social sciences, a moral prerequisite for anyone who wishes to enter the profession, makes scholars naturalize their own evaluative judgments as matters of self-evident um, fact. So pronouncements of inequality, which are of course value judgments, right? There can be no racial inequality among people who place no value in skin color, right? Or there can be no economic inequality among people who do not place any value in material wealth, right? So in it, the, the statement of inequality, which is a value judgment, um, appears in the writing of social scientists as a statement of natural fact which is not subject to discussion or certainly not dispute. This hegemony of our own normative sensibility, what we may now call the, our liberalism, is precisely what Dumont tried to push against with varying degrees of success, I think. While his work on European values and theoretical writings on value as such have continued to inspire social scientists working all over the world, working in the Amazon, in South Africa, in, in Melanesia and so on, his frigid and what I think is deeply Christian um, picture of caste hierarchy, which bears very little resemblance to what you can observe in Indian life, its dynamism, its multi-vocality, um, has put subsequent generations of, India, of Indianists rather off hierarchy. <laughs> and you can understand why, you know, if you, if you give students Homo hierarchicus, the great opus on, of, on, on Indian caste hierarchy, it just, nothing happens. Um, <laughs> right, and, and you can sort of see why. But if you give them the, the, the introduction, which is actually not, as, not more about India than it is about the United States, and begins with a quote from Tocqueville, um, and then his writings on um, value in, in Europe, things really start happening. And, they don't get interesting. Anyway, so the generations of Indians have been put off hierarchy, and so while hierarchy patently persists as a crucial fact of Indian social life, that's, there's no dispute about that, no theoretical discussion or debate now surrounds it, only denunciation. But if we suspend for a brief moment our belief that equality is the necessary condition for just and good and, and fair human life, it should not be too difficult to see that inequality can be both a good and a bad thing. Nobody, whether they're committed to the ideal of equality or otherwise, thinks well of a situation where some, some have a great deal of money, power and privilege that allows them to do whatever they please to others who have less of it. Um, they may be pleased to be able to wield such power and to be terrible, abusive people, but as a principle, nobody really agrees with that. But inequality need not be exploitative. It can also be, on the contrary, a structure of care. Think, for example, of the quintessentially hierarchical relationship in our own lives, the parent-child relation. It's by definition, by essence, unequal. It's unequal socially, it's unequal morally, it's unequal legally and economically. But if you were to describe to someone who knows nothing of this relation as a relation of inequality, you'd probably fail to convey what it's really about. What it is like to be in it, the kinds of pressures and pleasures that people experience within it, and so on. 
No doubt relations between parents and children can be abusive, but what defines the relationship as such for most is the experience of a combination of intimacy and responsibility, where the fact of parental superiority obliges them to be intensely responsible for their children. What makes someone a parent is not shared genes, but the assumption of responsibility for their children. This is both a culturally widespread social fact documented ethnographically around the world and a current legal reality. So it's not your genetic paternity or maternity, but rather your um, duty of care, as it were, makes you a parent. What hierarchy is then, in contradistinction to inequality, Quality, what makes it indeed the opposite of inequality rather than its synonym, is the allocation of responsibility that the idea entails. The idea aligns responsibility, it's very simple actually, with people's standing and the ability to act effectively in the world. So that people with greater wealth, greater status, greater power are held more responsible than those who have less of it. Or in the formula of the European Ancien Regime, noblesse oblige, privilege obligates. So while Dumont paid actually very little attention to responsibility in his work on India, the conception of hierarchy as a logic of responsibility is central to older anthropological literature, South Asianist and otherwise. It runs very uh, clearly through the huge Africanist literature on chieftaincy and kingship, um, which is described as fundamentally a normative structure of social care and responsibility. Um, it's also um, um, part of an early anthropology of, of leadership, um, as well as um, of anthropology of Southeast and South Asia, as well as Africa, uh, about kingship, comparative uh, work on kingship as, again, a, a structure of responsible generosity. In South Asianist anthropology, the idea was first really developed properly, explicitly, in theoretical terms, by um, Hocard, and further articulated ethnographically in literature that's now very outmoded, um, um, which is work on Jetmani relations. Does anyone remember? Yes. The Jetmani relations, right? Yes, I read that as an undergraduate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so a lot of it has a, a, the flavor of, of the kind of stuff we don't do, but um, but the, the kernel of this idea of responsibility as the normative anchor of hierarchy, what makes it a good at all, and why people want it, why people value it, it uh, comes very um, vividly in the work of William Weiser, who wrote in the 1930s. Um, he was a missionary who did ethnography in a North Indian village. Um, and he described relations between castes, not in terms of purity and pollution, but rather um, as, an, as an order of mutual responsibility, where each caste um, ob was obligated to perform for other castes in the village um, ritual and economic services. Um, this work, both Hocart and the Jijmani ethnographers who, um, who followed, um, was ca um, carried forward by a group who I think are the most and the only effective conceptual critics of Dumont's model of hierarchy, who rejected this monistic holism of his purity pollution model and argued that at issue were really relations themselves, that we need to look for value within relations rather than within some sort of an entity um, based um, ascriptive value, right? Um, and relations themselves we should view as a structure of responsibility. So this is um, Raheja, this is Quigley, um, this is uh, Diane Mines who's written this stuff quite recently. But again, this literature is not, there's not, there's not, there's no more work really going um, in this direction. Um, so what they were saying is that there is no pyramid, there's no ladder of rank, there's no agreed upon overall shape that we can draw um, or sort of submit to social scientific metaphors, but there's a structure of mutual expectation differentiated fundamentally by rank and role, which is in no way in conflict with mobility, with aspiration or otherwise dynamism of social life. And I'm right, so this book that is coming out next year is precisely about hierarchy as a vehicle of aspiration and mobility and and achieving a good life in a very dynamic way. Um, but th this kind of, th I'm, I'm not saying things that are drastically new, they're just unusual 
today. But William Weiser, who's sort of written off as somebody who created this very static model of a perfect Indian village republic, actually wrote about people moving in and out of the village, um, protesting, changing positions. So the whole thing, if you actually read it, is about very lively life. <laughs> Um, so, uh, getting back to this, as in the parent-child relationship, the responsibility that superiors bear for their subordinates in hierarchical reckoning is not only greater in degree, but also in kind. Just as parents are not just responsible to their children, they're not just accountable to them, um, as bureaucrats are accountable to us, supposedly, but they're responsible for them. Superiors are responsible for their underlings' well-being. which is a very powerful model of responsibility, one that is sort of total and engrossing, much more so than the model of being accountable. Now, these are, of course, ideal horizon, but their force in shaping people's decisions and judgment um, and involvement in the democratic process is not diminished by their distance from what actually comes to pass or by the difficulty of their achievement. This powerful model of responsibility is also not confined to the so-called traditional hierarchical societies, but also informs the so-called modern egalitarian societies' moral sense and their involvement in politics. Think, for example, of family values that are such an important part of American political rhetoric, which appeals to a people's longing for a life shaped by hierarchies of generation and gender. Or think of the intense anger felt in Europe and the United States at the inability to hold our economic or political grandees, heads of banks, corporations or states, personally to account in our laws. Right? Whenever something goes wrong, they simply resign from their position and wash their hands of responsibility. Only in the most drastic cases, such as crimes against humanity, do we hold leaders personally responsible for their actions. Um, otherwise, it is a position which a person can assume or leave that is the culprit in the law. And people are very upset by that, and I think we share that upset. Now, in the ambient Euro-American morality, it is really the person who is re held responsible. And the higher a person stands, the more responsible we feel they should be, hence the anger. So while states shed increasing loads of responsibility onto individual citizens, what social scientists have been calling recently resp responsabilization, what an ugly word, citizens hold the powers above no less responsible than Indian voters hold their political leaders. Or think, for example, of the recent election of Donald Trump to American presidency. While liberal commentators were stunned by the fact that trailer park colonies voted for the president, uh, for the resident of a golden tower in Manhattan, um, many Americans chose a man who was not like themselves, not through the principle of any kind of equivalence or identity, um, not an egalitarian set of ideas, but someone who in their eyes had, was as unlike themselves as possible, who had terrific wealth, status, capacity, power, whatever they attributed to him, and thus could run their state much better than they could. Um, now, in India, despite changes in the presumptively traditional structures of social hierarchy, the country has not undergone a kind of anti copernican revolution, suddenly um, imagining the social world as flat. As ethnographers know, even if egalitarian ideas have made their inroads, they have not done so to the extent that could account for the scale of India's democratic boom across divisions of caste, class, income and education. Hierarchy as a logic of responsibility has not vanished from the ambient social or more specifically political domains of life, and whether in households, temples or at political rallies, people expect their superiors to be responsible for them, to care for them, to be there for them in times of need and they see their politicians as their superiors. This idea is very visible anywhere you go when you are observing Indian political life. It's visible in the choreography of popular politics and local conceptions, um, audible in local conceptions of corruption, um, in the language of political appeals, palpable in descriptions of an in interactions with political leaders, um, and the way that they style themselves during campaigns. So right across the country, voters celebrate their political leaders as kings or gods. They stage spectacles of coronation, and they install them, um, the images of their leaders in temples where they worship them. This is as true of politics on the political right, as it were, as on the left. Followers of, who venerate Modi, their followers who venerate Modi and Mayawati as much as they venerate Sonia Gandhi and, and, and Mamta Banerjee. 
Nor is this confined to poor people's politics. The rich and the educated and the urbane engage in, as much, in it as much as the poor and illiterate villagers. Um, if you step into one of the thousands of darbars, which are of course royal courts, but this is the term for daily audiences which Indian politicians um, hold right across the country, you will hear people address politicians um, with very clearly hierarchical terms, such as my bab, which means parents, mother and father, and data, giver of bread, sarkar, which means state, government, but also lord or boss, or dada, which is big brother or, or grandfather, or with the English word boss. Whatever the particular semantic inflection or cultural hue of these terms, these are certainly superior terms of address, and certainly not ones you would hear a British MP's constituent within a British MP's constituent surgery, where I also did field work to try to get a sense of the difference. Um, now, cosmopolitan commentators demure at the widespread worship of politicians as an eccentricity or a kind of archaicism of local political culture, or deride it as a survival of a feudal mentality that turns the principles of democracy on their head. They say that here politicians run their constituencies like feudal fiefdoms where resources and influence run down personal lines of command. So they say that instead of legislating on their voters' behalf, Indian politicians allocate the state's fiscal, legal, and administrative resources as personal favors and gifts in a top-down system where the drastically disempowered citizen is left to beg and appease those in power by means that sometimes take the form as grotesque as deification. They say that you may extol India's electoral verb, people's involvement, but this is not really democracy as democracy ought to be. It is democracy gone topsy-turvy with the power, proper power relations between voters and politicians as their representatives arranged back to front. Here, politicians are not at all people's representatives, but sovereigns in a system that turns citizens into their subjects. But anyone who has watched Indian voters negotiate demands with their political representatives knows that what they see is anything but a submissive or disempowered electorate. In personal interactions with politicians, much as in publicly staged assertions of claims, um, bigger scale protests and rallies, Indian citizens press their representatives to do for them all kinds of work, as they say. From the building of roads and schools to the funding of weddings and hospital treatments, Indian politicians are expected to take full responsibility for their constituents' well-being, and generally to do much more than what people in Euro America normally expect from their states even, not just from, obviously from their political representatives. When people lament widespread corruption <coughs> in India, obviously the people I've spoken to, um, what they often mean is not the misuse of public office for private good, not embezzlement or political favoritism, but the failure of politicians to protect and provide for their people in good measure. So a corrupt politician um, is not crooked, but stingy. He doesn't betray his political office, but the people who are loyal to him. And this is an extremely widespread um, conception of corruption. Needless to say, in India, as anywhere else, more often than not, politicians fail to deliver, or to deliver anything like what the people expect from them. Often they simply have insufficient resources to do so, causing a great deal of disappointment among the electorate. They complain that Indian voters, so politicians have complained to me numerous times, that Indian voters do not understand an MP's or an MLA's duties and role. They say that they have primitive ways of thinking, that they have no sense of how the modern state really works, and that they think of their representatives as omnipotent kings. And yet, no career politician can safely ignore their electors' comprehensive demands. And so they press bureaucrats and policemen for favors to their constituents and dole out huge sums of money out of pocket. How they get that money is another story, but they do dole out huge sums of money that um, goes far beyond their um, allowances to fund both private and public goods for their constituents. Anything from hospital treatments to schools and roads and latrines. 
If in the UK parliamentarians bemoan the fact that increasingly they are expected to act as social workers, this is a term they use, instead of as legislators, to do the work that properly ought to be done by the state, in, Indian, in India politicians, and these are people ranging from members of parliament to um, the local um, level worker within an MLA's um, group, they describe themselves prou proudly as social workers, exactly the same term, who get the work of their people done. They promise their, work, their voters who in return expect from them personal care and generosity, grounded not in claims to identity with them um, or any kind of equivalence, but in a robustly vertical social imagination. So political representation, you will say, may well be structurally hierarchical here, but what of equal political participation, democracy's egalitarian cornerstone? Doesn't every Indian citizen feel personally entitled to and empowered by having a vote of their own? Which is what we hear from um, a lot of analysts. Is not the fact of India's hard-worn universal suffrage, which gives each adult citizen a political voice, in itself a local political value? No doubt some Indian citizens cherish precisely this sense of political equality, and Mukulika Banerjee has written in this vein. But for those who I have spoken, I've known and spoken to, the vote means chiefly something else. For them, it was first and foremost a connection to a leader, an expression of loyalty that tied them, um, that tied a leader to their voters and tied them to other voters, not horizontally because they each had one vote, but by equivalence of political, uh, not by equivalence of political judgment or political preference, any kind of shared ideology, but vertically, it tied them to other voters by shared ties to a leader they were going to vote for. So as an expression of abstract opinion, the vote had little worth. And in 2014, there was a shift in electoral legislation that made this very obvious. So in the 2014 general election, the option to vote none of the above appeared on ballot. It appealed, um, um, so, so to vote, right, to, cho to choose no one, to say that there's no one on this list who even nearly um, matches what I think politics should be about <laughs> or, or can achieve that. So none of the above appeared on ballots, but it appealed or even made sense to very few people. So my interlocutors in Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh could not understand who exactly this nota was, so they assumed that this was a person, <laughs> um, which is funny to us. I mean, it's sort of, it sounds silly because it sounds like a, a, a miscomprehension, but I, it's, it's, a, it's a very telling thing because these people were not at all stupid and they understood a great deal. So when a friend, a middle-aged farmer from southern Rajasthan, understood that Nota was not a person and to vote for Nota was to vote for no one, and expressly so, he was rather dumbstruck. And this happened time and again with people I talked to. Why would I spoil my vote, he asked. Why would I throw away my vote? So for him, his vote was an expression of a relationship, not an expression of some abstract political preference, not a marker of political, um, of the capacity to um, have one's voice heard in, in some sort of unrelational sense, in the way, of course, that Soviet, um, Soviets who voted and post-Soviets have been writing across their ballots, none of the above, mm -hmm. for a long time. So it's a very, very different sensibility. So as a mere symbol of political participation or expression of political opinion, a vote was a waste. Voting was not a matter of, for him of being equal to other voters and his capacity to express political judgment, but one of allying to a leader whom he felt he could trust. For him, political participation was not centrally a matter of joining a community of voters or citizens, but a vertical relation of care, loyalty, and trust. There's a lot more to say on this, but these are sketches of various <laughs> things. So hierarchical value is, of course, not all there is in Indian politics. No value, however, however valuable it is, excludes other values. None is comprehensive or even distributed, um, or evenly distributed or immune to challenge or change.
it's in the nature of value to, to change and to be learned and unlearned and so on. The value of equality is no doubt part of India's current political life. All kinds of political collectives, such as caste associations or caste conglomerates, super castes, um, Dalit or and Naxalites and ethnic separatist movements, or the Hindu nationalist and communist organizations, they have been organized, at least formally, through egalitarian principles through one or another kind of perceived equivalence, such as caste or ethnic identity, a shared history of untouchability, or shared political or religious views. I say formally organized because on closer ethnographic inspection, and actually there is not very much ethnography that gives you uh, a really dense, thick view of how these um, communities are organized, and that really is where I think we should be looking now as anthropologists. Um, so, on closer inspection, and there have been about a few accounts, a handful of good accounts, such collectives often turn out not to be organized, and not only to be organized hierarchically, but also hi recruited by hierarchical means through sort of patronal networks rather than appeals to lateral ethnic or shared ideological attachments. So, for instance, really good, diligent work by um, uh, somebody called Ward Berenshot on Gujarat riots shows that the involvement of um, of uh, various low caste communities in the riots was not uh, precipitated by uh, a successful inculcation of hatred of Muslims as Muslims on religious grounds, but rather through uh, political opportunity that they were presented with um, by being sort of being drawn in as uh, footmen within particular lords and bosses um, domains. And that, that really is not part of what we imagine the communal violence to be based on, really. Um, but this is rather a matter for another discussion. Suffice it to say that this may as well be the case, that egalitarian value in uh, political life hasn't actually taken off greatly. For in Indian politics, it is often ideologically egalitarian communities, these caste, um, super caste like the Yadavs or Naxalites, who openly advocate equality as the premier political principle, or Hindu nationalist organizations, which advocate an egalitarian um, um, sense of community of Hindu um, citizens, um, bound by a shared religious ideology uh, and belonging, that have wreaked some of the greatest chaos and violence on um, the South Asian subcontinent. Now, a few ethnographic accounts offer proper descriptions of the espousal of egalitarian value among the lower classes and castes. It's more assumed that any kind of assertion or protest must be based on egalitarian principles. Um, but an actual account of how people come to believe in equality is rare. But Freddie Bailey, some time ago, gave an account that is um, one of the very few vivid ones of how egalitarian values arrived in an Aryan village. And this is his book, The Civility of Indifference, which he wrote in 1996. It's more a memoir of what happened in the 50s. It offers instructive glimpses into the kinds of violence that um, the egalitarian ideas really ushered in with them. So once upon a time, he says, and still in the early 50s when he started doing his field work in Bisipara, his village in Orissa, um, the village was home to the Panos, who were an untouchable caste. Prior to independence, the Panos had their own place in the village, quite literally their own place. They lived in their own part of the village with their own temples and fields and wells, and they had their own occupational and ritual role to play. They ranked low socially. Brahmins thought them too polluting to touch or even to be sort of seen around. But their distinctive position entitled them to social respect within the village and gave them a sense of dignity. Not dignity based on the idea of them being equally human, but on the idea of them being panos who have a place in the village too. They were not humiliated by their position in life. And that's what Bailey, I mean, he gives a rich ethnography of his interaction with them. But come the 1950s, mid-1950s, and egalitarian ideas started, started to spread. More particularly, ideas about equal entry into temples, which was legislated in 1949 as the Temple Entry Act. So if before no Pano was ever interested in going into a Brahmin's temple, just as a Brahmin was not interested in going to a Pano's temple, there is probably some asymmetry in that, but that was just not uh, an idea that was uh, abroad. 
the passing of the temple entry bill and the political rhetoric um, that surrounded made Pano youths feel insulted by being barred from entry into Brahmin temples. They started staging protests, clashes ensued, people died, and so on. This is obviously a very brief account of what Bailey says, but it's really worth paying attention to him. This was, he says, the beginning of caste violence in the village. And actually, it is just as Tocqueville warned. The leveling of social hierarchies is always fraught with the possibility of disaster. It doesn't necessarily spell disaster, but it is fraught with its possibility. Not just with the tyranny of the majority, but also, and more profoundly, with the demise of a moral structure of responsibility, a collapse into totalitarianism. Although, of course, he didn't use that word himself. No doubt the egalitarian language of rights, citizenship or brotherhood is now part of many Indian citizens' political vocabularies. So not just communities based on, equal, uh, on, on the principle of equality. Um, but in India, the most heated staking of claims and contests over entitlements among India's um, historically underprivileged classes has not revolved around the ideal of equality, but again around hierarchically structured appeals to communal distinctiveness, which are enshrined, of course, in the schedules of the Indian constitution as the grounds not for um, equal right, but for special entitlements, and the demands placed on state imagined as a patron giving out these rights. This is ubiquitous now. Um, so be it Hitra protests or Dalit protests or Gujar brawls with Minas over scheduled s status, um, we can see it repeated again and again. The fact was not, the fact that um, these protests have not been rooted in ideas of equality was not lost on India's egalitarian political thinkers. From Ambedkar to Pratap Bhanu Mehta, who have been lamenting that the Indian masses, good though they are at staking their claims and pressing demands, fail to do so through the very principle of basic equality. So while the lower castes make hierarchically grounded claims, it's actually the upper castes who have been, um, who have lost out from reservations, who have been agitating for equality, for removing the provisions of positive discrimination. The irony, of, of course, is that Ambedkar's great intended equalizer, the program of reservations, has generated new hierarchies of privilege within the scheduled communities. And it is opposition rather than appeals um, to it that is framed in egalitarian terms. Meanwhile, egalitarianism has become an elite status symbol, a mark of educated progressive modernity for the urbane, the wealthy, English medium educated middle classes. And um, Ajanta Subramanian has written about that in the context of um, Carolyn um, economic and caste elites. So hierarchy, they tell you, is a thing of the past, now how the backward village people think. But of course, um, the English medium educated are all egalitarians. Now, there's nothing uniquely or even distinctly Indian about the preponderance of hierarchical value in India's democratic life. In the history of European democracies, from the ancient Greek to the modern American, um, democracy has only occasionally been thought of as a specifically egalitarian political form. Quite often, um, in visions of democracy both in the ancient world and in modern Euro-America, equality was perceived as either irrelevant, partially relevant, or indeed antithetical to democracy. So in the fourth century before the Common Era in ancient Greece, to which we look as the cradle of democracy qua political equality, political thinkers who thought well of democracy didn't tend to believe that political power should be distributed equally among the citizens of city-states. Citizens, they thought, had different worth, they had different wealth, they had different aristocratic uh, birthright and different virtue, different education. They were thus differentially able to make political decisions. And it was only right and proper for them to have different degrees of political power. There was a hierarchy of citizenship and a hierarchy of rulers and those who ruled over them. Hence Aristotle, who said that the will of those with qualifications are the greatest, uh, should prevail. Um, otherwise, many thought Democratia was liable to collapse into Ochlokratia, which was the um, rule of the mob, 
And so the word democratia, which we now think is describes government of equals, was actually used as a general term that described both political systems that distributed power in a graded hierarchical manner and to those systems which were indeed distributing power on equal terms. But there was a more particular specific terms for those governments known as isocratia, which literally means rules of, rule of equals. But that was a very peculiar form, a very unusual form of democracy. Um, and it was practiced in Athens, one of the many uh, city-states which were democratic at the time. Now, when modern representative governments were first founded in Europe and the United States, few associated democracy with equality. In the 18th century, for instance, political thinkers either side of the Atlantic thought that the governed and the governors, whether they were elected, divinely ordained or otherwise, were just never going to be equals. So the authors of the American Constitution were not egalitarians. Of course, they owned slaves and they happily excluded women from franchise. So leaving at least half of the members of their political community, and women were members of the political community because they were subject to state law and taxation, and they had property rights, um, they left them out of the political process. Because for them, democracy differed from other forms of government, not in its leveling of differences among electors or between electors and the elect, but because it allowed people to choose their superiors. The very people who wrote that all men are created equal and that this is a self-evident truth knew all too well that should political power in fact be dispersed equally, the country would be vulnerable to the crude and the ignorant, and so they left the choice of Americans' president to the College of Electors, a better informed and competent superior citizens. On the other side of the Atlantic, even during the French Revolution, absolute categorical egalitarianism was only the preserve, the preserve of a violent outlier faction, the conspiracy of the equals. And even Rousseau, who's a very famous ad advocate of equality, described the ideal representative democracy as an elective aristocracy. He did not think of it as um, a government of, a, of citizens equals. Later on in the 19th century, Tocqueville wrote that the French peasants treated political representatives, including himself, he ran and was elected for political office, um, they treated their representatives not as their political equals, but as grandees whom they revered and on whom they relied in a very similar manner to what I've observed in India. Over in Britain in the 17th and 18th centuries, committed egalitarians, Quakers and levelers, were always a socially and politically marginal lot who have never really exercised any serious political influence for any stretch of time. Here indeed, right until 1950 in Britain, a system of plural voting entitled property owners and people affiliated with universities to multiple votes. That is very, very recent. And that was also the case in New Zealand and, and, and in Ireland and quite a few other places. Cross the ocean and fast forward to contemporary United States of America. And if you think that um, Rust Belt and Trailer Park America voted for Trump, as I said earlier on, on the basis of any kind of egalitarian thinking through a sense of identity or equivalence with, them, with him, I will assure you that you are wrong. The moral effort that we Euro-American moderns need to think our way into a non-egalitarian normative sensibility, I think holds out rich intellectual rewards. Although it isn't easy, it took me a very long time to even begin to um, take what my informants were saying seriously. Mm. Thinking our way into a non-egalitarian normative sensibility, and of course one can talk about hierarchy simply in those terms, but I am um, loath to talk about something which I think is a very um, widespread and positive, um, no, especially normative sensibility in, in a negative term <laughs> as non-egalitarian. Um, it holds out rich intellectual reward only, if only because it pulls us away from what has become an infallible and absolute value. Um, a value of equality, something that all of us, whether we are on the political left or the right, whether we're Rawlsian, whether we are um, so Rawlsian believers in equality of opportunity or Marxist believers in equality of outcome, um, have come to perceive as the necessary condition of every social and political good. Not a sufficient condition, but a necessary one. The alignment of this value with our sense of democracy has been particularly muddling for comprehending the ways in which people, the world over, or indeed right next door to us, think and act within their democratic lives. 
lives that the liberal normative vision of democracy blocks very severely from view. It's not a matter of creating minor blind spots, but of a pretty serious blindness because non-egalitarian hierarchical sensibility is not a cultural quirk, but the ordinary way to conceptualize social life. And Marshall Salins and David Graeber have just issued a very fat book called On Kings, mm -hmm. um, which is an attempt to point out how peculiar um, egalitarian ways of thinking, which are not, which are varied and we, they have been well documented they exist, um, whether they're sort of widespread culturally or whether they're part of a bigger um, social um, constellation of values, um, how, how peculiar they are. And this is some, something that Marshall Sullins has been doing for about 30 years now, trying to think with vertical social imagination, as it were. Now, um, as I said, the ethnographic archive makes it very clear that most people, most everywhere in the world, live with the understanding that we're not one another's equals. Um, and indeed, in Western moral philosophy, the notion of basic equality, which demands more legions than investigation, it remains for those who dare to sort of tackle it the most intractable problem, the problem of on what possible grounds can we think of one another as equals. And that this inequality, so the the understanding of most of people and most everywhere um, is that inequality is not in itself an evil but must be put to good social use. The question then becomes how do you do it and that varies very widely around the world. It is the idea, it is egalitarianism, the idea that we must flatten inequalities to make life good. That is historically and ethnographically peculiar and thus a very poor orienteer for comprehending and judging humanity, not only because it's ethnocentric, but because it's so unusual, really. Um, and a great, one can say, cultural and political achievement, uh, depending on what you think of it. Um, now, what I've hoped to have done today, and I'm finishing <laughs> pretty much on time, is not convince you that I am right about the preponderance of hierarchic value in democracy in India, or indeed its presence anywhere else, but to convince you that it may really be worth your while to suspend briefly your egalitarian convictions and to think with rather than against hierarchy, and thus together with most of the rest of the world. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sure this provocative talk <laughs> is uh, bound to be spurring questions, and I believe there's one already right here, yes. and then uh, so Shelley, and then Vivek, and then Shudito. Thank you. That was a very super, super interesting and challenging talk. Uh, uh, so the, the, the obvious question for someone like me is to think historically about hierarchy, mm -hmm. and to wonder whether the image of a caring structure of structure of care and responsibility uh, is the way people within hierarchy in the past have thought about it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not clear to me that that's actually the case, mm -hmm. at least in South Asia, at least in the historical record I'm mm -hmm. familiar with. On the contrary, there has been mm, 1,500 years mm -hmm. of sustained attack on mm -hmm. hierarchy mm -hmm. uh, from all sorts of angles, religious mm -hmm. and social and economic mm -hmm. and political. Mm -hmm. What do we do with, mm -hmm. what, do, what do we do with, I mean, if, if there's a, if we want to be encouraged to think with hierarchy mm -hmm. as a positive normative value, mm -hmm. what do we do with the generations of the dead mm -hmm. weighing on our shoulders saying, don't think that way? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is where it becomes really important to distinguish between hierarchy and inequality. And protest against inequality and thinking mm -hmm. about inequality critically is not at all um, incompatible with hierarchical thought. And the interesting question is how, do, how does one shift into the other? Mm. If you think of them as opposites, actually the history of attitudes to one's superiors um, is a really important history to document. How do, when do you start feeling that it is a terrible injustice for somebody to have more 
to be entitled to more, to have more power. Um, when do you not mind about that at all? Mm, mm. Um, what conditions create that, um, turn that into what I would call hierarchy, a relationship where the entitlement to more, the having more, the, the being different and, and, and gloriously superior becomes a positive thing. So one can think, for instance, about starvation mm. about in terms of um, distributive justice and to say that people are starving and the reason for that is that others have taken it from them and have it. Mm. And if you, as in Bulgakov's novel, mm. the, the dog who turns into a human says, well, you just take everything and divide it equally, that's the solution to, that is an egalitarian solution to the problem of social evil. Um, whereas if you say that the guy who has more owes you that, it's fine for him to have more, but he owes you to be fed. Um, and. It's not a question of comparing, you know, I don't compare myself to Bill Gates, for instance, but I do mm. think it's right mm. and proper for mm. him. That is an egalitarian, uh, sorry, that is a hierarchical mode of thought. Mm. Um, but of course, because we come from a fundamentally egalitarian um, perspective, we just do now. And it's, it's really bizarre, it's really recent actually, this. It's really sort of 30 years or so that mm. we've really become, I've uh, come to think that way, all kinds of um, the, the muddling of terms that are actually opposite normatively makes the, the, the whole process of, of deciding whether somebody should or shouldn't have more and how they should behave in that position makes it very legible. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I just, yeah, I'll let others speak, but yeah. I just, I just think the um, the the second uh, critique of hierarchy, having more and mm -hmm. not distributing evenly, is also part of the is also part of the long term critique mm -hmm. in South Asia. So mm -hmm. it's uh, in fact one of the founding myths of early Buddhism mm -hmm. was precisely around mm -hmm. that narrative. Of yeah. The primal stuff that some people took, mm -hmm. and the rest of us were left out. Yeah, I think this had, you know, this had a kind of continuing reverberation uh, across mm -hmm. history, mm -hmm. um, even into the new, yeah. even into Ambedkar time. Oh I, well, yes, I'm not. Yes, I'm not sure that. Yes, mm. I mean Ambedkar was educated at the LSE, and he has this, his family well, he has a history. Educated here, Columbia. Sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He was he was at the LSC as well. For right, no, 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 I understand. But I think you're right <laughs> so, yeah. that Dewey, Dewey, yeah. Dewey's well, influence on Ambedkar was yeah, terrific, yeah. enormous, and yeah. I think highly consequential with yeah. respect to some of the. I mean, I was very struck by the idea that you know a certain vision of mm -hmm. equality produced the violence at the village level yeah. that yeah. you described in yeah. the uh, Orissa yeah. book. Uh, I mean the. The way that I've been talking sort of mm. more to my anthropology colleagues, mm. um, where it's more sort of crunching social theory on, an, on a sort of mathematical, almost analytical level, is that egalitarian thinking is concerned with uh, the problem of commensuration, that it's comparison of what people have or what they are, some kind of property or quality of, of them, whether stuff they have as alienable possessions or, you know, their skin color or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, that is the concern, whereas um, the kind of uh, hierarchical thinking that I've been listening to watching in, in India, um, it's not concerned primarily with the properties of people, but with the properties of relations. So if a person relates to you in an appropriate way, the question of whether they have a palace and you don't is just of no consequence. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, their glory sort of reflected on you. And that is a very, that is a, a very present um, mode of thinking, again, throughout hundreds of years of Indian political thought and, and moral and theological thinking. Um, now, another thing that's really important, which mm. your question really brings up, is another terrible, misleading thing that the reading of homo hierarchicus and actually homo hierarchicus itself has, mm. has led to, is that there is this idea that there are hierarchical cultures where the hierarchical value um, dominates, its preeminent value or something like that, and then there are these egalitarian cultures. Right. But what's really true, and that's why I was trying to bring examples from our own life, parent-child mm -hmm. relation, but also, you know, political relations, um, is that these are modalities of normative thought, which 
which I think are sort Agreed. of both necessarily present. And the interesting thing to think about if you're thinking about how value structures life is what their dialectic is like. But before we can even get there, I think it's really important to get some bearings on what we're talking about when we're talking about hierarchical thinking. Mm. Um, so, yes, Good. thank you. For thank you. We'll move on to the next question. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, What's your name, sorry? Vivek. Vivek. Uh, my book is also on uh, elections. Mm -hmm. And so what I found interesting about the presentation was that so much of what you said flew in the face of my own experience in the field. Mm -hmm. Um, so, a couple of questions. One is, um, you said that you know, it's usual for voters to look at political representatives as some sort of kings, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's, what did you say, it's useful? Usual. It's usual. Oh, usual, sorry, yeah. I didn't hear you. Yeah. Um, uh, so, I was wondering, what, do you, mm -hmm. what sense do you make of this idea, which you also find floating around, and which I find is very widespread, mm -hmm. which is that, um, the winner of elections uh, enjoy a certain kind of legitimacy because mm -hmm. they are seen as uh, the representative of everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not anyone in particular, but everyone in general. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. connected with this idea is this you know, notion that the results of elections actually reflect the will of this general actor. This completely abstract actor called the Janata. Mm -hmm. Janata being mm -hmm. an absolutely central vernacular concept mm -hmm. in yep. politics. Yeah, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. also connected to this is this idea of the arm mm -hmm. And this is completely average person. Mm -hmm. So if you kind of take a Tocquevillian mm -hmm. view of uh, equality as a principle, you know, this mm -hmm. kind of slowly makes its way to the democratic mm -hmm. imaginary. All these mm -hmm. ideas, the Janata, mm -hmm. the Aam Aadmi, mm -hmm. and this idea of the representative as the representative of the Janata, not mm -hmm. of anyone in particular. Mm -hmm are kind of ideas of that kind, right? Mm -hmm. They are sort of uh, based in which the idea of equality seems to have kind of made its way into the democratic mindset. That's one. Mm -hmm. The second question was, um, you know, about the value of the vote and whether, you know, what kind of value do people put on their vote, right? Mm -hmm. is, you know, sort of, is voting and seems mm -hmm. participating, mm -hmm. right? I was thinking that it's true that you know people who are within these patronage networks, they do look at their representatives and their vote as some kind of a return for the services that they get. Right? Mm -hmm. But considering that by any estimate, the number of people who are within these patronage networks mm -hmm. is, I would say, small. What about all those people who do not have, a, have an axe to grind, who actually never get any of this sort of kickbacks? Right. In my experience, mm -hmm. whenever I've asked them, why do you vote for the party that you would vote for? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they would, they usually say that, uh, well, we're not going to get anything in any case. <laughs> no one asks us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we'll vote the way the Janata is voting. Mm -hmm. We're going to vote the way... The majority, yeah. Right. Like said, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so for them, it mm -hmm. seems, right, so not wasting their vote mm -hmm. is actually... Um, the idea is actually connected with the, you know, what is liberating about the voting is the idea of one man, one vote. Mm -hmm. right? At least I have a vote. Mm -hmm. I might not get any feedbacks, mm -hmm. but at least, at least I have a vote. So that is again. Um, so, and I feel that this is the vast majority mm -hmm. of people. Right? So the so two observations which mm -hmm. I thought were kind of, so, and it's, it's perfectly possible, right, that you kind of go into the field and depending on who you talk to and who is asking, mm -hmm. you get completely different answers. Mm -hmm. Just one, one more last point, mm -hmm. so kind of a question also, that um, especially in the secret ballot point, mm -hmm. right, where, and of course, and, uh, the, 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 the sort of social structures in which these people, sort of, is of course, hierarchical, right. And in my experience, I've found that voters are not really forthcoming with, uh, you know, sort of well, yeah. But the same way they vote, yeah. right? <laughs> because uh, again, who is asking, mm -hmm. and whether they can be kind of outed, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so the way they vote and what they say mm -hmm. often diverge. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people say that you know voters take the well, money, that's hard to know at all. Yeah, but vote whatever you yeah. want. Mm -hmm. 
right? And a lot of people do do that also, right? They mm-hmm. say that we take the money, we take the blankets, oh, yeah. we take the liquor, mm-hmm. but we'll vote. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And um, so again, mm-hmm. so. Um, Sorry. Right, so let me comment on a few things. So there's some kind of counter evidence. Have you yeah, no, to absolutely. This? Yeah. No, that's very good. Um, I'm not sure that it's actually counter evidence. Mm-hmm. But some, um, so um, I've actually written about this um, the way that people respond to perks, as it were, you know, liquor or money or whatever. Um, now, in political science, vote buying is assumed to be one kind of transaction that, you know, you, um, that the morality of it is obvious that you have this contract and you know but actually the way people treat it of course they'll take the liquor and especially the cash um but when what um a relationship with a politician that has any moral significance um is is constituted of is long-term um um long-term obligation um and so there's a huge difference between somebody trying to buy a vote, which is very offensive, which is completely moral and doesn't tie in you into anything at all. And of course you can take the cash. And the way that this kind of distribution happens is by people usually going at night now and giving out perks and mm-hmm. saying, like, vote for us. And they sh- the door shuts. I've been in these households, I've, you know, I've, when people say, great (laughs) score you know we'll take that money um because that is not a moral transaction at all when you are eating at someone's feast in the middle of the village you are saying that you are that i am going to vote for you and that really has serious pull and i've said to people well can't you just eat at all the feasts and then vote however you like and they said to me yes well the, 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 the woman I lived with said, yes, but I have to live in this village. <laughs> I have to, you, you can't as a, as a grown up, so children go around and eat everywhere as they do at all the weddings, um, but as a moral, um, cogent and uh, adult moral entity and <laughs> person, um, you cannot eat from everyone's hand, which is this trope of being a stray person, somebody who is, um, who is, I- incoherent morally, inco- not reliable, not trustworthy, so r- really not a moral agent at all. So um, there are these ties which are created through a distribution that has one particular set of normative meanings and through another where people, of course they'll take the cash, <laughs> which that becomes even more complicated because if somebody comes into your house in the middle of the night and offers you some cash, the wife will take the cash and say, that's great, because she doesn't have a public presence in the village, whereas the husband, uh, I mean, I describe ethnographically a, a real fight within the family where the husband said, I can't be known because this will get out. They'll know that I've taken this cash and that is my sort of face spoiled and so on. And the wife said, for God's sake, you can take from every, you know. So, so there's a real difference between um, between buying and buying or buying and giving but you know um, gifts that create relations and gifts that don't at all yeah mm-hmm. um, and that's very uh, clearly distinguished by people even if there is disagreement about <coughs> each particular case yeah um, now the business of Janata as um, a concept of the people or public or um, I think it's an extremely complicated term and I haven't really thought about it very specifically for any length of time but um, sort of the first call response would be to say that it isn't at all like the notion of an ethnic community, for instance, or a society, which does assume some sort of equivalence. When you say Samaj, Hamara Samaj, whether, whether, whether they mean our caste, our subcaste, or... Um, Jonathan doesn't really designate that at all. It's an extremely vague term, which has no sort of social specificity. Um, just like a people, you know, this Ober, uh, this, what I was telling you about, um, you know, um, Demos, meaning a people, not at all the people in the modern sense of the word, or not a community of equals of any other sense. But it would be extremely important and interesting to think, you know, so that's that's what we'll be trying to do mm-hmm. soon, I hope. Um, 
Same thing. So ethnic, just one last ethnographically. The so your ethnographic reports on people valuing this vote um, as. As, as as sort of a even if they don't get anything from it it sort of signifies their participation in con political community being a citizen it's sort of precisely because society mm -hmm. is not uh, equal yeah so this is one equalizer <laughs> yes so this is Mukulika Banerjee has been reporting similar sort yes, of things <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah um, well it's interesting the people who talk to me in those terms um, were the people who tended to be the eldest people in their families, often women, men, um, for whom it really mattered that they um, were seen as participating in the political process. The rest of the family, daughters and law, you know, youths, um, they didn't care at all. And they're the ones who have to be ferreted out at 3.30 in the afternoon. The political party sort of workers start coming out to the houses and ferreting everyone out to get everyone to vote. Um, because those are the people who don't value their vote in that same sense at all. And who either they feel um, sort of sanguine about just following what their mother or mother-in-law or father had said they should do and how they should vote, or they just feel a bit grumpy about it and don't really care for it. So again, it is something that is embedded in structures that aren't necessarily, you get term, but each head of family, yes, they, they have um, mm. a sort of sense of that being their entitlement. Mm -hmm. So let's move to a question by Shudito, and I think we have a number of others, and then Gauri, and mm -hmm. see what there's time for. Maybe keep it a little bit brief. <laughs> Maybe we can just take yeah. a couple of questions. Couple of right, yeah. okay. Uh, I will I very, have very, very interesting things which we shall discuss. But I wanted to raise two things. You know, one is following up on what Shelley said, but taking a very different kind of tack. I thought that what is interesting about Dumo, for instance, is that he places so much of emphasis on what he considers to be a pre-modern or a traditional form of thinking. But there's very little engagement takes should be with where that thinking is done. Mm -hmm. You know, for instance, if you, uh, I'll give you an, a quote. Uh, in mm -hmm. some versions of Manu, mm -hmm. you get a quote which is about mana. Yeah, yeah. What is mana? And uh, I think that mm -hmm. connects to something that you are yeah. You are trying to do in your paper. It says, Vittam Bandhu Vayak Karma, mm -hmm. Vidya Bhavati Panchami. It is very mm -hmm. simple. Mm -hmm. yeah. You yeah. can understand yeah. it even in Hindi. Etani Manya Sthana Ni Gariyo Riyad Yadutara. So, Vittam Wealth, mm -hmm. Bandhu Family, mm -hmm. uh, Vaya Experience, mm -hmm. Karma Achievement, yeah. whatever you are doing yeah. in that. Vidya, of course, it's yeah. done by Brahmin. Yeah. <laughs> Vidya yeah. is the fifth. Mm -hmm. These are all manya sthanani, mm -hmm. these, these are all grounds on which yeah. you can give mana to somebody, mm -hmm. but garyor yad yaduttara, mm -hmm. that is the vidya is actually the lowest mm -hmm. and vidya is the highest. Yeah. But yeah. what is interesting is that you know, it might be interesting for you to go in that direction, mm -hmm. because when you are saying, I was fascinated by something that you said, but I was surprised that you didn't bring in any vernacular into, into mm -hmm. that, because I think mm -hmm. it would it mm -hmm. illustrate what mm -hmm. you are saying. What I found fascinating is that you are saying that there is a prejudice in modern social science. Mm -hmm. To my mind, you know, as a uh, vestigial Marxist, uh, I think it's absurd to say that the university is a totally egalitarian place. We are always trying to become equal to each other. Mm -hmm. Yes. But anyway, I think it's yeah. an ideology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. But the thing is that uh, you are saying that your know, hierarchy must be seen as a value, mm -hmm. which is hard for us to understand. Mm -hmm. We see hierarchy as a failure of the value of mm -hmm. equality. Mm -hmm. And you are saying that there are societies in which hierarchy mm -hmm. is a value. Mm -hmm. And inequality uh, is not a value. Mm -hmm. And I think what is interesting is that, you know, I thought of, uh, I was thinking of Bengali, what we would do this Mm. In, if I speak mm. in Bengali, mm -hmm. you know, hierarchy would be man, mm -hmm. man mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Bengali, I think also probably in Hindi. Mm -hmm. And inequality in Bengali would be Asham, mm -hmm. Samya. Yeah. So you have the opposite of Samya. Yeah. Right. So I thought that you, that is one thing that yeah. you should probably look at. And yeah. I simply had a, a simple question. When you spoke to these people in, in Hindi, mm. 
what are the terms that they use mm -hmm. for hierarchy and inequality? Mm -hmm. I agree with you that yeah. hierarchy and inequality are very different sets mm -hmm. of terms. Yeah. But what do they use in one And could you just write yeah, that down yeah, for a moment and yeah, we'll take yeah, a couple no, take more questions? Gauri, yeah. so mm -hmm. sort of vernacular yeah. terms mm -hmm. for um, terms you're using. Um, I, I was actually interested um, to hear um, your thoughts about Gandhi's mm -hmm. um, you know, position with, in relationship to um, hierarchy because so much of his thought seems to be very evocative of um, mm -hmm. exactly what you are mm -hmm. describing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But you know, for, you know, when when Gandhi talks about hier hierarchy, mm -hmm. he's also talking about it in the context of organic <coughs> communities. Mm -hmm. So that you know, hierarchy is 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 not a standalone term. It is something that has affiliation with some other um, concept because alternatively um, one could easily ask you know what distinct you know what makes hierarchy not quite feudalism mm -hmm. or not quite paternalism mm -hmm. because there and maybe that was the gist of what Shelley was mm -hmm. uh, was asking because there is that there is that moment when mm -hmm. you know much of what you are describing could also be dangerously close to mm -hmm. to paternalism but what salvages it um, mm -hmm. uh, from that and it's in that context that I was actually thinking of mm -hmm. um, to go at the home in the world and Rana Jeet Guha's mm -hmm. um, you know piece on mm -hmm. uh, the home in the world because I think the the, the way that you know the the character of Nikhil sort of demonstrates what you were describing mm -hmm. as um, you know hierarchy as a value mm -hmm. because it's embedded in relationships of protection and responsibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. But you know Rana Jeet Guha makes this really you know probing um, comment about how mm -hmm. you know what distinguishes that kind mm -hmm. of of um, you know, positive hierarchy is um, um, you know the, that when Nikhil, the character, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. espouses hierarchy, it's in relationship to um, persuading you know people to mm -hmm. you know to act in certain ways. Whereas the antithesis is the use of force. You know that you know the revolutionaries are the ones who are using mm -hmm. force, but mm -hmm. you know Nikhil is using um, uh, persuasion. Mm -hmm. So I, I was interested in how you know you um, you know going back to Gandhi. Uh, who also figures in Ron, in Guha's um, um, essay um, or chapter on um, the home in the world? You know how one can sort of think about hierarchy in such ways that it doesn't actually invite its more dangerous possibilities. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Yeah. So yeah, that's fine. Well, I, I think we're going yeah. to take some questions, yeah, yeah, and you might that. not be able to answer them yeah, all. But I'll do we'll my maybe best. Yeah. Just have a couple more. The back there, please. Yes. Um, hi. So uh, you, you mm -hmm. spoke about your, you know, the Indian family being hierarchical and positive hierarchy in, in terms of, you know, responsible to your children, etc., mm -hmm. etc. But I, you know, so many of the Indian families are predicated on a sense and a culture of gratefulness and a mm -hmm. culture of of mm -hmm. being of obedience and gratefulness for what you're receiving. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, I've, you know, from my own experience, when I used to question my parents, they'd say, how dare you? Mm -hmm. We stop doing whatever we do for you. Mm -hmm. how, how dare you question our, our you know, our mm -hmm. stand. So how, how and, and because we there's a culture that's that's grown up in this, in this thinking, in this mentality, mm -hmm. hierarchy, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know, but I mean, in, it's, it's, there's a subtle sense of uh, of power play and mm -hmm. which is being, you know, used against you, which is being, you know, gouged as responsibility, I think, mm -hmm. which is not really true. Mm -hmm. It's actually obedience and gratefulness and uh -huh. therefore guilt tripping you when you don't accept yes. it. <laughs> can I take this? Sure, just really briefly. briefly yeah. Because we normally actually finish at yeah. this time, but yeah. we can um, take a couple can more can questions. Can I just have a question on that thing? On exactly yeah. this? Okay. Yeah. You know, we start by the metaphor of the family. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of both troubled by it, but also I saw mm -hmm. big promise in it. And mm -hmm. the reason I'm troubled is that regardless of how you conceive the normative family, mm -hmm. the actual family in anthropology 
through literature is in, disa- in a disaster. Yes. It is a site of <laughs> profound uh, violence mm-hmm. and of abuse. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that for me is what's the source mm-hmm. of my, why I'm troubled by mm-hmm. this model. I mean, why you would set up a family. Mm-hmm. But also for the sa- same, uh, you know, at the same time, a source of great fer- f- you know, fertility mm-hmm. uh, in thought. Because the thing is that, you know, it is precisely in the family, mm-hmm. uh, you know, whether in the West mm-hmm. or, you know, I don't want to distinguish between the Indian family or the Western mm-hmm. family or the, you know, nuclear family or what. But mm-hmm. in families of every kind, profoundly, it's not just the, their, their nature is not intrinsically hierarchical, uh, you know, for me, not mm-hmm. necessarily, um, you can't necessarily only describe it as essentially hierarchical, mm-hmm. but these are essentially sites where claims of equality, dignity, liberty mm-hmm. are, are diurnally articulated on a day, I mean, by, mm-hmm. by its mm-hmm. members mm-hmm. Uh, on a continuing basis. So the thing is that you know, your schooling in community, mm-hmm. uh, you know, is, you know, profoundly informed by that schooling. So in that sense, I feel, you know, it's, it's more, you know, you invoke the family as a site for learning, as a site of hierarchy. For me, it is precisely because it is not, it is a site for the adjudication of claims uh-huh. uh, on a yeah. daily basis of these, you know, Western values that you mm-hmm. about. That for me, I find it very interesting. And, and secondly, a very quick point for me, it just seems to me that you know the, another minor point mm-hmm. that you made was a, a thing very, very important, which is that you spoke about the fact, uh, at least for me, uh, uh, the, the, the failure of India and countries like India seem to be that we have not achieved you know an impersonal state mm-hmm. in the way that um, you know the West seems to have achieved. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is, you know, uh, Indians on mass have rejected the, the supposition mm-hmm. that uh, or bluff that. Mm-hmm. That the state is supposed to be exist at arm's length. Mm-hmm. Uh, now the thing is that for me, um, you know, so egalitarianism as impersonality mm-hmm. is something that you know seems to be at the root of what you're trying to address, which is. You know, I, I don't know if I got it right or wrong. very exciting, and I'll do my best to sort of pull these two together. Now, I think the really important thing I'm trying to get across conceptually is um, that it's really important to keep apart um, the ideas of what I suppose one could think of as the distinction between long and parole, right? So there's in linguistics classic distinction of the principles and grammatical the principles of that organized language the the vocabulary the 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 set of uh, phonetic um noises that are mean uh, the set of meaningful noises on the one hand and that to learn a language you need to understand those and then there is the actual utterances which vary differently which vary infinitely rather um and I think the ways that people have talked about hierarchy has rather described the latter, um, which doesn't help you to understand how people organize their relations, how they organize their judgment. And if you think about hierarchy as a set of ideas about how people across differences of worth can relate well, um, then you can understand this not as a harmonious um, order of life, but rather as as how people think and argue against each other and place uh, responsibility onto one another. And this is a really much more sophisticated, I think, way of thinking about power than most social scientists think. Uh, social scientists think of power, which is a kind of version of crude force exerted on someone else. But to place responsibility on someone, and for that to be a, a widely agreed sort of thing, you ought to be doing this is to exercise power so in in these asymmetrical relationships power can and does at least in normative terms and they do have real force I mean that's culture for you you know the, I mean where the recourse is becomes a very interesting mm-hmm. other question but th- it goes both ways and we know that India in history is full of very effective protests from beneath <laughs> um, which are framed in these very terms where you have the right the moral cultural right to place responsibility on your superiors precisely because you're styling yourself as an inferior so there's a lot of this rhetoric of um, of um, subordination which is actually a very aggressive sort of way to demand something um, and here, what is important to understand is that in order to make your claims, you aren't saying, I am your equal, because that's actually disempowering yourself. You're saying, I'm your dependent, and dependence becomes political opportunity rather than uh, a disempowerment. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so relations, I mean, a close analysis of family relations, I think, would reveal the workings of hierarchy as I'm talking about it. Um, 
in uh, very very vividly. Now that I think brings us to Shudipta's question about what terms can this lo does this logic have? It would be really interesting to think with with words perhaps in Sanskrit uh, as well. But actually just as some of the most fundamental concepts anywhere don't have words because they're so important that the water you swim in i don't think there is there are indian words for um hierarchy it doesn't mean that words and concepts don't coincide and i think the absence of words actually can point us in the direction of some very significant and very possibly complex concept that is ubiquitous through society. The way that I've been pinpointing it in my ethnography, in the way that I've been listening to language, is simply um, it is there, but in the language of reference to high, low, big, small, these um, contrasts that are just really central to the way people talk about social worth um, and and goodness, right? Which um, which is distinctive. Question from a very patient man. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, mean, I originally was going to, uh, when you started out and talking about the quality of the democratic value, mm. I was thinking, uh, she's missing all these points, and then of course you brought them in later on. But I think that there are, uh, if you're talking about hierarchy and democracy, mm. there are actually two separate questions. One mm -hmm. is what happens to pre-democratic pre hierarchies? Mm -hmm. How are they integrated into the system over time? Um, and I don't know if you're familiar with Barrington Moore's work, uh, uh, Social or, or yeah. Dictatorship yeah. Democracy, yeah. which I don't know how well it applies to post-colonial mm -hmm. structures, but you know, I mean, it, it does get, give different pathways and somehow landed aristocracies and bourgeoisies mm -hmm. creating political systems, um, either by integrating the aristocracy or the Russian Revolution, get rid of them, whatever that may have to be. But then there's a question of, once you do have an established democracy, how does yes. the hierarchy develop after that? Mm -hmm. And those are two separate questions. Mm -hmm. And I think that, it, you know, I don't know how you would address mm -hmm. them. You're, from an ethnographic mm -hmm. approach, you're looking at uh, you know, smaller bits that aggregate. But um, you know, the, the process, I mean, in the United States, you have someone, you know, very, at the beginning, a very paternalistic mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you look at Madison's Fed 10, we always quote it. We don't put mm. the second half, mm -hmm. which is the second half is is all about you know how we need you know, these enlightened yeah. sort of whatever. Yeah. Um, and yeah, no, he was certainly not. And none of them would have can, none of them considered the, you know, the the sort of uh, Jacksonian democracy developed you know, less than fifty years later. Mm. So the, it, you know, how is you know how is hierarchy previous to democracy incorporated and then how did how do new hierarchies develop? Mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah, I think there are different this questions about the last yeah. question. Yeah. Okay, but we can okay. continue the discussion. Yes, the let's shortly. do. Yeah. Yes, I think the question of the history of the movement of of strata in society as they are perceived, if they are if they're perceived on the basis of land ownership or wealth, um, is quite separate from this vertical imagination that I'm talking about and how it was deployed in. Um, devising a democratic system or and how it continues to sort of guide popular imagination. It's one thing in how a constitution is written and a very different thing in how people are voting now. Um, and or, we, I mean, how, they, you know, how yeah. the political mechanisms develop over time. Sure, sure. But what happens in, in the history of political um, life is that it... It, there's an assumption that the categories and institutions, that the categories of formal political thought and institutions which were very intensely informed by this thought are actually expressive of how people around us in America, in the United States of America, in European countries, actually conceptualize their political lives. And I think that is even more um, misleading than using the Western categories of thought and institutions to understand other parts of the world. Because <laughs> at least there we can say, well, they really are different, whereas here we think that, you know, and that, that's, that's why a lot of um, 
nobody can predict. You know, people can't see the most obvious thing, and they can't hear when somebody's saying, "This is why I'm voting for Trump." They just won't listen to it because it's just not within the frame of. I, I just got a point about that. Everyone else, that he got less votes than Romney. <laughs> Small percentage of votes, yes. even with some sure. and say it's equal. <laughs> you know, it's right. it's not a big change. It's just it's from yeah. on the top. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for this very rich paper and conversation around this.